Greetings, my fellow historians. Um, today, what we're going to talk about is some of the earliest American civilizations to take root in the Western Hemisphere, or at least in the North American part of the Western Hemisphere. Um, before we get down to what former President Richard Nixon used to like to call the nut cutting, um, there's a few things that we need to talk about, and the first of which is something that I will come back to again and again in this class. It's something that we refer to as American exceptionalism or America the Great Exception. Now, there's one thing I want to get straight very quickly before we go any further in this class, and what I do not mean by American exceptionalism is the idea that we're somehow God's chosen people or that we're exceptional because we're so superior to anyone else um, and we should all pat ourselves on the back. I don't mean anything like that. Um, really, what I mean by America the Great Exception is comparative in its orientation. And that is, how do we stack up against other great civilizations of the past? What sets us apart from those civilizations? Are we different from them? Or are we the flavor of the month? Um, think about it. Uh, you know, there, there was many civilizations that had their day in the sun. You could point to the British at the height of the British Empire. Um, are we different than the British? Are we more small d democratic? Uh, do we include more people in the democratic process than the British, which were also a democracy? Think about the ancient Romans. Um, they certainly were a very powerful civilization at the height of their reign. Are we different? What sets us apart from the ancient Romans? So I want you to think about that issue um, as this class continues to unfold, because as I said, I'll come back to this quintessential question again and again, including on assignments. So, in any case, one thing as far as I'm concerned, one thing that you can really point to uh, when it comes to America the Great Exception is our, our, our actual makeup, the people that make up what you think of as American society. Now, if you're following along in this video lecture, you don't need to listen to this, but if you're listening to me on the podcast, it might not be a terrible idea at some point, it doesn't have to be right now, but to go ahead and download the PowerPoint that accompanies this podcast. Right now, I'm on a slide called What is America? And it features a lot of different people, in some cases groups of people. If this class were to be held in an actual lecture hall, one thing I would ask the students would be to point out the American that they see on that screen up there. And because this lecture comes so early in the semester, everybody's shy, everybody's trying to be anonymous, nobody wants to really stand out, let alone speak out. And then inevitably, somebody will very sheepishly raise their hand and, and kind of say, almost like the question is so easy, it's got to be wrong. Um, they're all Americans. And in fact, they're very right. They are all, in, you know, at the end of the day, Americans. Um, look at each of them, or in, in the case of the pilgrims and the Native Americans celebrating, you know, Thanksgiving or harvest season, um, doesn't get much more American than any one of those individuals. Um, one thing I want to make clear, in my mind anyway, when it comes to American exceptionalism, one of the things that does set us apart from the British and the Romans, and you can insert whatever example that you'd like here, is that there really is not an American DNA. There's not a set of physical characteristics that make an American. There's certainly no American gene pool. Uh, there's, there's definitely not an American race, so to speak. And the reason for that is one of the things that really defines American history is immigration. People coming to this nation for a lot of different reasons. Uh, and, and at the end, they rub, rub off on each other, making American life what it is today. We are, in fact, a nation of immigrants. Now, let's just say, um, hypothetically speaking, that you could prove, that you could demonstrate that you are 100% Native American. It would be very difficult to do this, by the way, but let's just say that you could. More historical archaeological and anthropological evidence is coming to light that demonstrates that even the earliest inhabitants of the Americas came from somewhere else. Um, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about here in a few minutes, but for right now, I want you to understand that part of what makes America an exception from ancient civilizations like Rome, for example, is that there really isn't a, a, an American DNA. We all come from somewhere else, and that's an important observation. 
There's someone else that I'd like you to kind of take stock of um, while we're on this topic, and that is in the top left corner of that screen. If there's one person on that screen that you should recognize, it ought to be President Abraham Lincoln. The idea of Abraham Lincoln, and I really do emphasize the idea of Lincoln, is exactly what I'm talking about when it comes to American exceptionalism. You know, back in Dickinsonian London, Charles Dickens, the novelist, um, if you were not born into a family that had wealth and especially land, it made you virtually nothing and it made moving into something, moving into a person of, you know, influence, power, prestige, whatever you want to call it, it made it next to impossible. Let me give you a little bit of background on Abraham Lincoln. And again, if this was a lecture class, I would ask the students what occupation Lincoln went into before he went into politics. And the answer is the law. He was a lawyer and a very capable lawyer. Then I asked students, where did Lincoln go to law school? Because if you're going to be a lawyer, you have to go to law school, right? It's a trick question in that Lincoln never went to law school. He was self-taught. Uh, to prepare himself to become a lawyer, he did two things. One was he read Shakespeare until his eyeballs fell out. And for those of you that go on to law school or something similar, you'll know that they will make you read and read and read. So that's a very important part of what it means to be a lawyer. And the other thing that he did that helped to prepare him for his career was he joined the Illinois State Debate Society. Um, this gave him formidable amounts of training, and when he opened up his law practice, he developed a very good reputation of being a capable lawyer, and people came to see him to try their cases. My point in using Lincoln is that he didn't attend Harvard University. Um, for that matter, he didn't attend the University of Illinois Law School, which is an excellent, excellent law school. His father was a Yemen farmer. He was a subsistence farmer. He wasn't a great big landowner or anything like that. He was born into the humblest of origins, but he worked hard. He had a good attitude, and above all else, he believed deeply in the American system of government. And what he demonstrated over the course of his life, that you can be born into humble origins, and if you work hard, have a good attitude, come back again and again and again, you, there's no limit to how high your talents can take you. You can become President of the United States, as Abraham Lincoln demonstrated. So that's some ideas that I'm hopeful will get you moving in the right direction when it comes to America, the great exception. And as I've said before, we're going to come back to it again and again. But right now, I want to talk a little bit about um, the beginnings of what we're going to call History 1301. Unlike History 1302, which actually begins in 1877, it's really difficult for me to pin down an, a hard date uh, for the starting point of our class. Um, if you looked at the catalog, you'll, you'll notice that it, it said something like pre-Columbian societies to 1877. Now, by pre-Columbia, um, what, what we really mean is the period that existed before 1492 when Christopher Columbus set sail and bumped into what he thought was Asia. Uh, turned out to be an entirely new world. But 1492 is that magic year because before that year, um, the, the old and new world had been cut off from one another for the better part of 3,000 years. Now to demonstrate what I mean by this, I need to, to introduce a term to you a term that geologists call Pangaea. If you know anything about Pangaea, you, you probably be able to tell me that this is a concept that emphasizes that once upon a time, and by once upon a time I mean millions and millions, hundreds of millions of years ago, geologists believe that the Earth's land mass was all interconnected. And then over the course of hundreds of millions of years, what happened um, was, was natural disasters, uh, volcanic eruptions, ice ages, uh, earthquakes, superstorms, all of these things began to occur over the course of hundreds of millions of years, and it broke apart this supercontinent. And then what began to happen was what we call continental drift. The continents began to drift apart from one another, carrying the living organisms with them, and over the course of hundreds of millions of years, if you look at that slide entitled Pangaea, at the bottom of it anyway, you get the world as you and I know it today. Now, what does that have to do with History 1301? What does that have to do with history at all? And the answer is a lot. Um, 
we believe that the earliest Americans, what would later become known as Native Americans, that they actually came from Eastern Asia. Um, even DNA evidence is beginning to really heavily implicate this. Now, the story I'm about to tell you is one of several explanations when it comes to how the North and South American continents came to have people living in them. Um, approximately 15,000 years ago, and there, there's a good give and take with, with that figure, but we believe that 15,000 years ago, the Earth's temperature was much colder than what it is right now. And we believe that there was a land bridge that connected Eastern Asia with what is today Alaska. And so that part of the world. And because it was much colder, the ocean levels were much shallower. And part of this land bridge was literally land. And because it was so much colder, we believe that a lot of the ocean was locked in ice. And it allowed people to walk back and forth across these two continents. So Asia, once upon a time, we believe, was connected to northwestern North America. And you had these hunter-gatherer societies that were chasing wild animals, elk, deer. Um, they were chasing these game uh, to greener pastures. They were chasing greener pastures. There were fruits and vegetables that were growing, and they were just following the seasons. And we believe that they began to cross over what historians call the Bering Strait. This land bridge that I've been talking about, that is what historians call the Bering Strait. And we believe that some of the earliest Americans crossed the Bering Strait and began to populate what we call North and South America. Again, over the course of thousands of years, the Earth's temperature began to rise. And when it ro rose, um, it, 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 it unlocked a lot of that ice. The ocean levels began to rise again. And, and what was once upon a land uh, now became covered in water. What was once upon ice became part of the ocean again. And over the course of this process, what happened was those, the, the, those people that had come across the Bering Strait were cut off from the rest of the old world, Asia, Europe, Africa, for the better part of the next 3,000 years. Now that is very important, the fact that they're going to develop independently over the course of thousands of years. That's very important, and you're going to see why when the Spanish start showing up into what would become modern-day Mexico. There's all kinds of things that the Spanish are going to bring with them. Some of those products, like horses um, and wheat, they're going to knowingly bring across. And some of them, like diseases, uh, they will bring indirectly. In any case, because those Native Americans had been developing independently of Europeans and Africans for generations, that's going to be a really important thing. But we believe one explanation as to how and why there were people in the Americas when Christopher Columbus bumped into the Americas is because of the Bering Strait. I emphasize one, because there are different explanations. There are different ways that historians have of explaining how there were people in the North American continent. But we need to move on. I want you to understand that before Columbus had bumped into the Americas, we believe that there were 40 million inhabitants of what historians refer to as Mesoamerica. Now, let me explain something. Mesoamerica is Central America. I mean all of Central America, including the islands, but I'm predominantly talking about Mexico. If you can tell me that Mesoamerica was Mexico, you're going to be fine for the exam. 40 million people, as opposed to another 7 million that would call home to what would later be known as the United States and Canada. So the northern part of North America, 7 million people. Now, first of all, that's a lot of people. Um, in, in what would be North America, I'm also including Central America there. But there's a big, big difference, right? There, there's so many more people that are living in, in Mesoamerica as opposed to North America. If you ask yourself why, just apply a little bit of logic, a little bit of common sense. The growing season in Mesoamerica is much longer, and that makes making a living much easier. It makes living much, much easier than, you know, a place like Bemidji, Minnesota, where if you get two and a half months out of the year where you can grow corn, you're, you're doing pretty good. And so, obviously, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be easier to not only live there, but also have children, raise children, and the next generation taking over. That's one explanation. But more importantly, the kinds of societies that will develop in Mesoamerica, 
are going to be very different than the kind of societies that will take root in what you think of as North America. And you'll see exactly what I'm talking about in, in our next lecture. But the ancient civilizations that would really come to define Mesoamerica are going to be different than what you probably think of when you think of um, you know, Native Americans. Um, you know, I don't know about you, but I, I really get a Hollywood definition of Native American uh, when, I, when I think of that terminology. Uh, people riding around on horseback, hunting buffalo, living in teepees. The fact of the matter is, not, not only is that completely wrong when it comes to those societies of Mesoamerica, but even if you're talking about North America, that only represents a very tiny sliver of the Native American population, much more complex than what Hollywood would like us to believe. What I want to do today is introduce you to two ancient American civilizations, beginning with the Mayans. Um, we believe that around 700 BC, 700 years before current era, Mayan civilization began to take root in the lower part, the southern part of Mesoamerica. Think southern Mexico, think Guatemala, think as far south as Peru. That's what I want you to associate with the proximity of Mayan civilization. Um, I'm willing to bet that many of you might be able to tell me a thing or two about Mayan civilization. The Mayans were a very sophisticated civilization, very advanced civilization. Um, what most people associate with Mayan civilization would be their calendar. And there's a very good reason as to why. Um, on the one hand, there was a movie that came out not so long ago called 2012, and it had everything to do with the Mayan calendar, which actually stopped in 2012. And the reason that it stopped in 2012 is because that the Mayans were very, very talented astronomers, and they could predict the time that it would take the Earth to orbit the Sun, and they felt that there would be a problem um, around about the year 2012, and, and civilization on Earth would cease to exist as we humans knew it. And so you have to understand that this was a massive achievement for an ancient civilization. I mean, on the one hand, the Mayans understood that it was the Earth that orbited the Sun, not the other way around. Many European societies had it completely backwards in that way, so that's an achievement in and of itself. But the Mayan calendar, which, 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 which was based on the time that it would take the Earth to orbit the Sun, one orbit, was accurate up to, I want to say, like two minutes. That's a remarkable, remarkable achievement, considering they didn't have things like, you know, telescopes, let alone satellites that we have. In any case, um, very sophisticated and advanced society. There's something else I'd like you to understand about the Mayans. Um, they were very talented businessmen and women. Um, they had extensive trade networks where they would bring in things that were not indigenous to that part of the world, um, and trade was the primary reason as to why. And being good businessmen went hand in hand with, with being good city developers. Uh, one thing that I would like you to, to associate with ancient Maya is that, that they were a, a, a civilization that created these great big, you know, grand cities. Um, example, the capital city of ancient Maya was called Tikal. Uh, located in today what, what is Guatemala, um, but we believe that we're more than 300,000 people living there at one point in time. Now, there are cities in our neck of the woods um, that are really considered suburbs that have more people than 300,000, but you have to understand that this is the ancient world. And, and even by European standards, there's only three cities, uh, London, Paris, and Rome, that came even close to 300,000 people. So the fact that there are 300,000 people that are having their needs met, that there are businesses that are taking place every day, that is another remarkable achievement and demonstrates, on the one hand, the Mayans were a very advanced and complex civilization, and on the other hand, they didn't have a lot of similarities with what, what kinds of societies would take root in, in what would become the United States and Canada. Um, when the Spanish began showing up in the 17th and 18th centuries, and they began to explore what had become Mayan ruins, Mayan civilization had long gone away by the time that the Europeans showed up, naturally they had a very, shall we say, negative sort of understanding of what Mayan civilization was like. 
Um, they considered them to be pagans. Um, they considered them to be backwards and primitive. And to be fair, the Spanish considered just about everybody that they encountered to be backward and primitive. So they, they, they were not singling out the Mayans. But part of the reason why is these, these Mayan ruins that were left behind, they, they left idols, sculptures, what, what the Spanish assumed were the gods that were worshipped by these pagan savages. Um, but over the course of the next few hundred years, what the Spanish began doing is applying a real scientific model to the history of uh, ancient America. And one thing that they began to realize is these scribblings. You're looking at some of them right now if you're on the slide called Studying the Mayan Civilization. Um, some of these, what they thought were scribblings, were not scribblings at all. You have to understand that the Spanish language is a, a, a language derived from Latin, which uses sounds to indicate words or meanings. Um, Mayan languages did not work that way. Mayan languages were much similar to things like Mandarin, uh, a language spoken in mainland China. Um, Mandarin and the Mayan civilization were a, a representative language where symbols represented concepts, words, or ideas. And so over the course of time, the Spanish are beginning to put two and two together. And when they kind of cracked that code, that there were symbols that stood for things, including events, what they were able to do was to piece together a much more sophisticated understanding of what life was like before Columbus showed up in 1492. Let me give you a really quick example. Um, what you're looking at here on this slide entitled Mayan Plates is what historians call the Palenque Plate. Now what Palenque was, was a city, a, a great big huge city in ancient Maya. Um, and on the side of those plates, that was a Mayan temple, um, on the side of those plates, if you look carefully at it, it looks like there's like engravings, almost etchings on that. Um, nobody really paid much attention to that over the course of the first few hundred years that the Spanish had dominated the North American continent. But once the Spanish applied these codices, a more sophisticated way of studying ancient Maya, they came to understand that what they were actually looking at is the early history of not only Palenque, but Mayan civilization. That what this told was the story of the Mayan civilization. And it was like that eureka moment when a light bulb goes off in somebody's mind that it was much more complicated, much more complex than what anybody had given the Mayans credit for. And so a couple of things as we wrap up our thought on this idea. Um, I think that in the next 20 to 40 years, we're going to have a much different understanding of, of what life in, in, in America was like before Europeans and later Africans showed up. And two, I think we're just beginning to understand how sophisticated Mayan civilization was. And the Palenque Plate certainly demonstrates that for us. Like all good things, Mayan civilization began to come to an end, and we think that it began to go into decline around 800 AD, after current era. And there's a number of different reasons as to why. Again, all of these are hypothetical, but there's some pretty solid evidence that demonstrates why we think what we think. The first thing that, that we think happened was climate change. If you're going to have cities, what that means is you're going to have to have a reliable food source that's being developed outside of the city, being brought into the city to feed all those thousands of people. And what that means is you're, you're going to have to cultivate huge crops. It's not going to be subsistence farming. You're going to be farming for urban markets. When you plow earth and you expose the soil to the raw elements, um, it's not a problem as long as you have uh, sufficient precipitation rain, snow, moisture, that, that is replenishing it and moistening it. When you don't, what you have is drought. And we think that over the course of time, Mayan civilization suffered from drought. And as it suffered from drought, um, the soil was completely depleted by, you know, raw elements of the sun. And the sun baked that soil and it turned it into silt, sort of like dust, and it blew it all away. And we believe that famine was a result of all of this. People starved, they didn't have enough to eat, and that was very difficult to continue life as the Mayans knew it. 
We also believe that the Mayans experienced an erosion of their middle class. Um, by this time, many of your more elite Mayan peoples found themselves doing business with people who were not Mayans, and what you had was a handful of very, very rich people and a vast army of people that did not have a whole lot, and so that made for a very unstable Mayan society. The combination of famine and the erosion of a Mayan middle class made the Mayans very susceptible to conquest. And we, what we think what really did in Mayan civilization was a repeated invasion of groups of people from the north and nomadic warlike people that called themselves the Mexica. Um, the Mexica are who you and I call the Aztecs today. These are the people that we've come to call Aztec. As I said, the Aztec originated far north from where the Mayans were living. Um, think Lake Texcoco. And the capital city, um, further to the south of Tenochtitlan, was really the hub of Aztec civilization. Um, Tenochtitlan is still with us today, only you call it Mexico City, a very, very old city on the Mexican, or excuse me, on the Mesoamerican uh, sphere. But over the course of time, the Aztecs became the dominant group of Mesoamerica, and by the time that the Spanish were making expeditions into mainland Mesoamerica, they had conquered most of that region. Um, the Aztecs eventually subdued the Mayans, and again, the Mayans were long since in decline, but nonetheless, um, they had built a vast, vast empire, but they borrowed very heavily from the Mayan civilization. If you look at that Aztec temple, um, it bears a striking resemblance to the Mayan temples that we were showing earlier in this lecture. That's not any coincidence. The Mayans not only borrowed heavily from Mayan uh, uh, Aztec um, uh, architecture, uh, the Aztecs also borrowed heavily from their religious history. Uh, they preserved the Mayan way of uh, writing. Uh, writing was good for you know keeping track of records. It was good for business keeping purposes. And so the Aztecs kept a lot of what the Mayans had kind of established and they made improvements upon them. Um, they made improvements upon their economic system. All of this made for a very advanced, sophisticated, complex society similar to the Mayans. But there's something else that I want you to associate with the Aztec way of life. Because they had established a lot of um, pockets of empire, they had subdued most of the Mesoamer Mesoamerican region, um, you had a lot of different people living under one roof, a lot of different religions, a lot of different ways of looking at the world, a lot of different customs, um, foods, languages, you name it. But over the course of many, many years, you, you get a blending of all these cultures. Now, what historians call this is a process known as creolization. Creole. Think Louisiana. Most people conjure up Louisiana when they hear the word creole. If you think of New Orleans in particular, it's a little bit French, it's a little bit Caribbean, it's a little bit Southern, it's a little bit American, it's a little bit of a lot of things. It's blended all into one thing. And that's what the Aztecs had basically established by the time that 1519, when Hernan Cortes makes this expedition of the Mesoamerican interior. It was a blended culture. And the reason that I'm mentioning this is that these ancient American civilizations drive directly at this idea of the American exception. The Aztec civilization was a blended culture, very similar to how our culture is a blended culture in modern day American life. Now, is there such a thing as too much of a good thing? And the answer is absolutely yes, there is. Whether by conquest or alliance, and I use the term alliance very loosely, I basically mean forcing, um, Mayan civilization had come to dominate virtually everybody on the Central American mainland. Now the reason that that's important is that the Aztecs demanded a tax, almost like a tribute, and what they wanted was obviously gold, treasure, and they also wanted people that could be sacrificed to the Aztec sun god. As I said before, some of these people were were not really 
conquered people. The Aztecs had purposefully left them alone because they wanted to draw off of their populations um, so that they could sacrifice their best and brightest young people to the Aztec sun god. Sometimes they would strictly be sacrificed, and other times they'd be forced to compete in this game that kind of resembled soccer, except you played it using your hips. You would bump the ball with your hips into this goal, and uh, the, the winning team would be sacrificed to the gods. You didn't want to sacrifice a collection of losers to the gods. You wanted to give the gods the, the, the greatest athletes so that the gods would be pleased. Well, as you might imagine, this creates a lot of resentment in those people that are sending not only their gold and treasure, but also, also their best and brightest athletes to the Aztecs. And by the time that the Spanish arrived in 1519, there were a lot of people that were none too pleased living under the dominion of Aztec rule. And to make a long story short, the guy that's going to lead this expedition of Tenochtitlan, a guy from Spain by the name of Hernan Cortez, um, he's going to find many willing participants, people that would become Native American allies of the Spanish and willing to go not only show him how to get into the interior of the Aztec society, but also fight alongside with them. Um, if you've ever wondered why there were only 500 Spanish conquistadors and how they were able to subdue not only a vast empire, but a very formidable fighting force, the Aztecs were no slouches when it comes to fighting. Um, these Native American allies were a good reason as to why. Now, the next time...